Well, good evening and welcome to our evening service here at Norton Lane. It's wonderful to be gathered at the end of the Lord's Day, the day that he's given us, one in seven, to worship our, our great God. If you're joining us live on YouTube, then a very warm welcome to you as well this evening. Just a, a couple of notices to, to remind you of. You know, the, the things coming up this week, and you can see some advance notices as well. They're, they're not going to be on the notices every week for the next few months, the 3rd of June and the 22nd of July, but just some things to jot down on your calendar to save the date. Saturday the 3rd of June, be a lady study day here at Norton Lane with uh, Natalie Brand, as Lucas uh, mentioned this morning. And then uh, Saturday the 22nd of July is our next uh, joint church's day out at Gretton Village Hall with uh, Gloucester and Wadden Road and Sully Hall as well. So just some dates for your diary before you plan your summer cruises and summer holidays. Just uh, avoid those dates if, if you want to go. Uh, next week we'll be celebrating the Lord's Supper in the morning, that's Sunday the 7th. And we've got our midweek prayer meeting on Wednesday, Christianity Explored continues on Tuesday. Do pray for that. We've had um, a few people coming each week. Now, this would be the third session and I think a few extra people have said they would like to come this week who have been away. So do pray for that as we go through Mark's Gospel. Good opportunity to, to study God's Word together and look at who Jesus is and why he came and what, how we should respond. And just a reminder that this Friday, 7.30, is Ladies' Fellowship at Cathy's House. Let's hear our call to worship from Deuteronomy chapter 7. Find at the top of your order of service. Know therefore that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations and repays to their face those who hate him by destroying them. He will not be slack with the one who hates him. He will repay him to his face. Let us pray now as we begin our service this evening. Our gracious and faithful God, the one who always promises to be our God and for us to be your people, the one whose love and, and covenant is steadfast and unbreakable, we bow before you, our unfailing God, even in our own unfaithfulness, even when we have turned away, you our sure and our certain hope that you will never turn away from us. So let us worship you this evening. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let us stand and sing our first hymn together. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation.
Bible reading this evening comes from Genesis chapter 4. Genesis chapter 4, you'll find that in the Church Bible on page 4. Genesis chapter 4, verses 17 to 26. Uh, Lucas this evening is going to be preaching from this passage and the second Bible reading, which is Genesis chapter 5. He started a a series in the evenings going through Genesis 4 to 11, that first kind of section of of the Bible after Genesis 1 to 3. And so let us hear the word of God from Genesis 4, verses 17 to 26. Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Enoch. When he built a city, he called the name of the city after the name of his son, Enoch. To Enoch was born Irad, and Irad fathered Mahujael, and Mahujael fathered Methujael, and Methujael fathered Lamech. And Lamech took two wives. The name of the one was Ada, and the name of the other, Zillah. Ada bore Jabal. He was the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock. His brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all those who play the lyre and pipe. Zillah also bore Tubal Cain. He was the forger of all instruments of bronze and iron. The sister of Tubal Cain was Nama. Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, hear my voice, you wives of Lamech, listen to what I say. I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for striking me. If Cain's revenge is sevenfold, then Lamech's is seventy-sevenfold. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and called his name Seth. For she said, God has appointed for me another offspring instead of Abel, for Cain killed him. To Seth also was born, a son was born, and he called his name Enosh. At that time, people began to call upon the name of the Lord. May God bless his word to us this evening. Well, before we come to pray... We're going to look at the next two questions in the Westminster Shorter Catechism, which we've been doing in our evening services over a year now. We're at question 61 and 62, the section of the Westminster Shorter Catechism, which is going through the Ten Commandments. And the questions have been following a similar pattern. They ask, what is the commandment? What does the commandment uh, mean? And then... What is it forbid and what reasons are there for this commandment? So with the fourth commandment about the Sabbath, you noticed in question 59 and and 60, don't worry if you can't remember, that was the 9th of April, the last time we did this, but go and have a look at the catechism and you'll see. You spent a bit more time in detail about what is meant by the Sabbath, well what day is the Sabbath, because in the Old Testament it was the last day of the week, a Saturday, the seventh day, but now in the New Testament it's the Lord's Day and the first day of the week. And we notice that that because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that, that day changed from being the end to being the beginning of the week because Christ rose again on that first day of the week, which is why we meet here on a Sunday. Sunday is now the Lord's Day. So the fourth commandment then is remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. And these two questions today, the last ones before moving on to the fifth commandment, what does the fourth commandment forbid? And then what are the reasons for the fourth commandment? So let us have a look now at these two questions in the shorter catechisms. Let me read the question and then we'll say the answer aloud together. So question 61. What does the fourth commandment forbid? The fourth commandment forbids failing to do or carelessly doing what we are supposed to do. It also forbids treating the day as unholy by loathing, by doing anything in itself sinful, or by unnecessary thinking, talking about, or working on our worldly affairs or recreations. 
Question two then concludes this section on the fourth commandment. What are the reasons for the fourth commandment? The reasons for the fourth commandment are these. God allows us six days of the week to take care of our own affairs. He claims the seventh day as his own. He set the example and he blesses the Sabbath. Let's come to our God in prayer now. Our Heavenly Father, hallowed be your name. Our great and glorious God, our Lord Jesus Christ, who said, I am the Lord of the Sabbath. The Sabbath is not made, is not man for the Sabbath, but Sabbath is made for us. The Sabbath is made for man. We thank you for this wonderful gift that you've given us. We thank you that in your plan and your desire, you want to spend time and relate to your people. And so you've given us a day by which we come into your presence and worship you. You've given a day which we are to set apart from our worldly affairs, from working and and earning money and from from doing other things and being busy with other things. You've given us this one day to come and to sing your praises, to enjoy fellowship together, to stop and to rest. Lord, we thank you for your kindness, your mercy and your compassion. For you know that we are our dust, that we are weak, that we are creatures. And you know that our greatest need is to, is to be fed by your word for man shall not live by bread alone but by every word which comes from the mouth of the lord we thank you that you are not a tyrant demanding us to work 24 7 seven days a week 365 days a year but you've given us those 52 days throughout the year to stop and to rest father we thank you for your goodness We thank you for your mercy that you know what's best for us. You know what we were designed to do and and it was to be in in fellowship with you. Lord, we can see that right from the beginning of creation when Adam and Eve enjoyed fellowship, intimate relationship with you, talking and walking with you. And since the fall and since sin has entered the world and death and corruption, that has been changed our desires now are not for fellowship with you, but with, with, with the creation and not the creator. Our desires have been to turn away from you and to reject you. But you so loved the world that you gave your only son, that whoever would believe in him and have tr- trust in him would, would not perish, but have a life. And what is this life? This life that we thought about this morning, it is knowing you the great and glorious God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Not just knowing facts about you, but knowing you intimately, like a husband and a wife, knowing you. We thank you that you've designed us to worship you and given us a day by which we may be more human than we are any other day of the week, doing what we were created to do in your image, giving you the glory, enjoying you forever. And so forgive us when we do not consider this day thoughtfully, when we are careless with how we think and speak and act on this day that you've given us, when we are flippant, when we are lazy, when we don't take the necessary preparations for coming to church. Forgive us of our many sins. Please help us. To set this day apart, not just physically, not just making a a cross over it on the calendar, but mentally as well. That today is a day for you. We ask that you would help us to honour you today. To love and to serve you. To delight in the Sabbath. This day that you've given us to rest in you. Our Lord and our God, we pray for the upcoming coronation, this this coming Saturday, Lord, you know there will be millions of people around the world watching the, the service on television and on the internet. 
Lord, we are not really sure of what kind of form that this service will take. When traditionally, it has been a very Christian service with lots of Bible readings and, and preaching and prayers. But Lord, we know, as we've seen in the news, that this could be more of a multi-faith service and just a much more modern um, service from what has happened before. Lord, even so, as your word is read, as, as people from uh, different churches take part, we pray that you may do a great work through the reading and praying and singing of your word in, in whatever form that might take to, to all those who are watching around the world who were there, to the king himself, Lord, open his eyes, convict him of his sin and bring him to his knees that he may confess Jesus Christ as his Lord and his King, that whatever he says following the liturgy of the service on, on Saturday, whatever he says with his mouth, Lord, that he will believe in his heart to be the truth, that he will remember his mum, the late Queen, and her genuine faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Please, Lord, bless him and Prince William and George and, and the future of, of our royal family. May they be a, a Christian family. We know that we live in a post-Christian country where such a small percentage of, of people in this country go to church regularly. Lord, I pray that you will do a great work this weekend as many people stop and watch this service in Westminster Abbey. We, Lord, we pray for Lucas as well, who's going to be speaking at the Christian Union on Tuesday evening. Lord, please be with him and bless him as he speaks on, on the topic of union with Christ. What a wonderful opportunity for him to, to speak to those, those young people there. Lord, bless him and give him all wisdom and, and everything he needs. May he do a great work there as for those students coming in. It's such a, a, a confusing uh, place as a university is and a student world with so many things pulling on their attention. We pray that the Christian Union will be a great place for them to come and to meet with you and enjoy fellowship with other Christians. Be with us now, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, before Lucas comes to preach for us this evening, we we'll read Genesis 5. There is a saying again, uh, For rock of ages cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. <laughs>
people of God. Our second reading this evening comes from, again, the book of Genesis. And we're going to be reading the whole of chapter 5. Last week we started uh, looking at Genesis and we looked at Genesis chapter 4, the first half of Genesis chapter 4, um, in which there, is, there are two offerings, the offering of Abel and the offering of Cain. And this week we are looking at two seeds, the seed of Cain and the seed of Seth. So this is the word of, of God from Genesis chapter 5. This is the book of the generations of Adam. When God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. Male and female, he created them, and he blessed them, and named them man when they were created. When Adam had lived for 130 years, he he fathered a son in his own likeness after his image, and named him Seth. The days of Adam, after he fathered Seth, were 800 years. And he had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. When Seth had lived for 105 years, he fathered Enosh. Seth lived after he fathered Enosh for 807 years, and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Seth were 912 years, and he died. When Enosh had lived for 90 years, he fathered Canaan. Enosh lived after he fathered Canaan for 815 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Enosh were 905 years, and he died. When Canaan had lived for 70 years, he fathered Mahalalel. Canaan lived after he fathered Mahalalel for 840 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Canaan were 910 years, and he died. When Mahalalel had lived for 65 years, he fathered Jared. Mahalalel lived after he fathered Jared for 830 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Mahalalel were 895 years, and he died. When Jared had lived for 162 years, he fathered Enoch. Jared lived after he fathered Enoch for 800 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Jared were 962 years, and he died. When Enoch had lived for 65 years, he fathered Methuselah. Enoch walked with God after he fathered Methuselah for 300 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Enoch were 365 years. Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. When Methuselah had lived for 187 years, he fathered Lamech. Methuselah lived after he fathered Lamech for 782 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Methuselah were 969 years and he died. When Lamech had lived for 182 years, he fathered a son and called his name Noah, saying, Out of the ground that the Lord has cursed, this one shall bring us relief from our work, and from the painful toil of our hands. Lamech lived after he fathered Noah for 595 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Lamech were 777 years, and he died. After Noah was 500 years old, Noah fathered Shem, Ham, and Japheth. This is the word of the Lord, telling us about the two lines, the lines, the, the line of, of Cain and the line of Seth. Now, on a slightly different uh, note, um, one of the most lovely things that I find in, in God's Word, and especially in the book of Psalms, is its rawness. All the undiluted human emotion on, on those doors that, that you and I maybe wouldn't dare to even, even knock, the psalm writers, they come and they, they kick the door open. How do you like Psalm 3, for example? When David, he had a bunch of people that were 
persecuting him and trying to kill him, he wrote Psalm 3, which says this. Look at this. He says, Arise, Lord. Deliver me, my God. Strike all my enemies on the jaw. Break the teeth of the wicked. Very raw. Or what about Psalm 22? David, he thought that the Lord had abandoned him. And he is not as careful with, with his words as you and I would be in our prayers, would he? Was he? He complains. He says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Or what about the irritated and annoyed uh, man who wrote Psalm 73? This is what Psalm 73 says. This is what the wicked are like. Always free of care. They go on amassing wealth. And then he complains and says, Surely in vain I have kept my heart pure and have washed my hands in innocence. All the, the day long I have been afflicted and every morning brings new punishment. He is upset. He's annoyed. The wicked, he seems to be prospering while he is struggling. He sees himself as a man who sought to walk in the ways of the Lord. He loved God. He submitted to God. But then when he looked around him, all his neighbors and and. There is a bunch of people who don't care about God and they are prosperous. They have great health. They never get sick. Their bank account is as fat as Rishi Sunak's uh, bank account. And then to add insult to injury, these wicked people who seem to be doing so well, they boast about it. They are arrogant. They go, and they, and they go on and they tell people that they don't care about God. They don't care about what they're doing. And they, they're going to continue to do evil as much as they want. I wonder if you have ever felt like the, the psalmist who is annoyed at situations like that. You saw people that hate God. And they seem to be prospering around you. They seem to be going on very well. While you, maybe a, a God-fearing Christian, encounters all kinds of trials in your family, in your finances, in your health. This is, is, this is not an uh, unusual experience, is it? And in Genesis, this chapter, the end of chapter 4 and chapter 5, the writer, he tells us this story of two family lines. The first one is the family line of Cain, uh, from chapter 4, verses 17 to 24. And then the second one is the family line of Seth from verse 25 of chapter 4 to the end of chapter 5. And the family of Cain, on one hand, it represents non-Christians, those who do not fear God and yet are prosperous. They seem to be doing all right. And the family line of Seth, on the other hand, represents Christians, those who fear the Lord but have no claims of of great success, to great success in the eyes of the world. And hopefully what we are going to see is that despite this apparent success of the wicked, their prosperity lasts only for a moment and is only on this world, on this earth. But the blessings of the righteous the blessings of those who belong to the family line of Seth, those blessings, they are everlasting. So have, let's have a look at those two seeds, those two family lines. The first one being the seed of Cain. Have a look at verse uh, 17. It says, Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Enoch. In the last section uh, of this chapter that we looked at uh, uh, last week, last Sunday evening, evening uh, Cain, he, he had put himself into great trouble. He offered to God a sacrifice that was displeasing to God. He offered to God a bad sacrifice. There was no faith in Cain. And then after he did that, he went on and he killed his brother. 
And then as a punishment, he was sent by God into a life of exile, far away from the presence of God. But then what happens at the end of, of that section of Genesis 4 is that the Lord actually is merciful towards Cain. And, and he kind of protects Cain from, from vengeance. He puts a mark in Cain and says that no one is going to kill him. And he sends him off. So Cain, even despite his wickedness, he still experiences God's blessing. And in verse 17, we see again the same grace of God. Cain, he received a wife and he bears children. You might remember in, in Genesis, uh, the first few chapters of Genesis, the first gift that Adam receives from God. God is concerned about Adam and he says, it's not good that a man may live alone. And, and he gives Adam a wife to be his helper and his lover. And now in verse 17, Cain also receives the same blessing. The same blessing that Adam received before the fall is the blessing that now, that now Cain receives after the fall. He receives a blessing. He, receive, he receives from God a wife. So Cain, he got to enjoy God's goodness. And not only that, Cain also had a son, which he calls Enoch. And if we read the, the, the book of Genesis, we're going to see that this idea of children... This idea of, of seed is something very, very important. This theme of, of procreation and, uh, and seed. Think, for example, of, of the three matriarchs of the Christian faith. Sarah, Rebecca, and Rachel. The three of them were barren. Until the Lord miraculously intervened intervenes and, and gives them children. And all those women that could not bear children, they are a sign of that woman that was going to come in the future, Mary, a virgin who gives birth. And even though there is struggle to have children in the side of, uh, of, of uh, these godly women, we don't see any struggle in the life of Cain or his wife. Even though he was a murderer, a murderer, he was blessed with marriage and children. And this is what is called common grace. It is the grace that comes from God that is common to both believers and unbelievers. And Cain, he receives this blessing from God. And then we might ask ourselves, what is the purpose of God blessing Cain with something that many women throughout history struggled with? Why does, why, why does God bless him with a wife and why does, he bless, does God bless him with children? What is the point of God blessing the wicked? And the answer we get throughout, from throughout the Bible is that the blessings that the wicked receive they should serve to draw the wicked closer to God. Those ungodly people, those people who do not follow Christ, they should receive all the blessings from God. And, they, and those blessings should bring them to repentance and obedience, to thankfulness. This is why probably Cain received blessings. Maybe he would turn. But this is not what happens to Cain. He does not repent from his wickedness. Instead, he defies God once again. We saw last week that the punishment that God had given Cain was that he was to become a, a nomad. He was to never settle. But instead of Cain receiving that punishment humbly, Cain openly defies God. Have a look at uh, verse 17, the part B of, of, that, of that verse. It says that Cain, he goes on and he builds a city and he names this, that city after his son Enoch. 
So it seems that Cain is prospering. He's ignoring God's commandments and nothing is happening to him. He goes on scot-free in continuous rebellion against God. And then if we read on, we're going to see that this rebellious, this evil seed continues to prosper. The offspring of Cain continues to receive from God grace. In verses 18 to 22, we see that they have wives and they have children. And their life without God continues just like your life and my life. And, and some could even argue that they are doing more than just going on. They, they are prospering even beyond expectation. Because the descendants of Cain, the descendants of Cain, they become great artists, musicians, engineers, farmers. They are the first to invent instruments and, and tools. And then we have Lamech, one of Cain's great, great, great grandchildren. He, and he goes on, Lamech goes on, and he breaks the design of God of marriage, that, the, the, the design that God has made of marriage. He goes on, and instead of taking one wife, wife, he takes two wives. And then he goes and kills a young man and writes a song about it. Boasting of his wickedness. There is no shame in Lamech. There is no shame in this evil seed. And isn't this exactly what we see today? Doesn't our world praise and gives literally, um, um, literally gives, the, gives people millions and millions of pounds to rappers and, and, and musicians that dare to boast about their sexual misconduct, their acts of violence and rebellion. It's not hard to turn on the radio and, and hear music of boasting about violence or boasting about sexual misconduct. So our world right now, it has a thousand lamecks. And yet, there they are, financially prosperous, and no one puts them in check. And the maybe surprising thing is that this section from our text doesn't end with a great defeat, because that's what you expect, you know, if we're reading um, children's book stories, we would expect a great defeat of these wicked people. You know, something's going to happen. They're going to have a great fall. But God doesn't bring any fire from heaven on their heads. He doesn't seem to bring any punishment for the wicked acts of, of uh, Lamech. Lamech seems to go on again scot-free. No punishment. And again, this can be very similar to our experience in, in this world. We see the wicked prospering, having children, going on with their families. They seem to prosper in, in their work, have uh, maybe great health. They start businesses and, and it works out. Nothing bothers them. And they go on and if you preach Jesus to them, they, they defy God, they refuse to worship they maybe mock Christ and his followers. They refuse to thank God for all the benefits they, they receive from the hand of God. And yet we don't see God punishing them. We don't see a thunder hitting them on the head, do we? And their story ends as if there was no justice in the world. They go on and on. And they die just like you and I die. And we are left wondering, why, Lord? Why? But let's hold that for a second. So this is the seed of Cain. Now what about the second seed? The seed of Seth. 
Does the godly seed of Seth at least surpasses that of Cain in, in every respect? Does it invent, maybe we would expect that the godly seed invents better instruments or better tools. Maybe the godly seed is more powerful, more glorious, more prosperous in this world. Well, we don't see any of that in chapter 5. Adam and Eve, the Bible says that in, in the end of chapter 4, Adam and Eve, they had a third son called Seth. And Eve, and Eve says, here is another offspring instead of Abel, another seed. And then in chapter 5, we have the genealogy of Seth. That unlike the genealogy of, of Cain, doesn't record any great deeds from the godly seed. There are no great inventors, no successful farmers, no musicians, no artists, no famous people. Yes, they, they receive common grace, that is, they, they have families and they have children, but they also receive that suffering which is, co which is common to every one of us, to every man who descends of, of Adam. And that is common as well to Cain. They are born, they get married, they have children, and they die. They are born, they get married, they have children, and they die. So they receive blessing, but they also receive that same curse. They die. And then maybe we, we look at this at this. Bible passage, and we can understand Psalm 73 that we looked at at the beginning of, of the sermon. The wicked Lord, they, he's, they seem to prosper. They go on with their lives, but we who belong to God, we who try to purify our own ways, we have nothing special. Quite, quite the opposite. We, we face the same consequences that the wicked suffers. Our experiencing life of, of living and dying is just like that of the wicked. The, the seed of Seth that we see here in chapter 5, the seed of God, doesn't seem to have an easier time than that seed of Cain. And this is because we as Christians and, and the seed of, of God, we are not immune to the consequences of sin. Death came into the world through one man, and all of us now face death. We all suffer from health problems. We all can suffer from financial difficulties. And we see that, and we can become annoyed like the psalmist. It is in vain that I, I make myself pure. It is in vain that I, that I seek godliness. Look at the wicked. They are, they are prospering. Maybe even more than I am. They are having things from God that I am not. It is in vain that I suffer. However, there are big differences between the godly seed and the wicked seed. The first big distinction that I want to call your attention to this evening we can see in verse 26 of chapter 4. It says, To Seth also a son was born, and he called his name Enosh. And then it says, At that time people began to call upon the name of the Lord. While the wicked seemed to prosper, the city of Cain and where they lived was far away from the presence of God. They were banned from coming into the presence of God. Yes, Cain and his family, they were prosperous, they were famous, they invented things. But they were utterly deprived of God. While for Seth and his family, they could call on the name of the Lord. 
And note that it wasn't simply Seth or, or Enosh or his immediate family who called upon the, upon the name of the Lord. It is said that the people began to call upon the name of the Lord at that time. Yes, they were not inventors of instruments, but they had this amazing privilege of knowing God personally. The word Lord that says in, in that verse is the personal name of God, Yahweh. It represents a personal relationship that the, the family of Seth could have with the Creator. Knowing him more than just Cain knew God with a head knowledge. The family of Seth, they knew God intimately. They knew God by his name. They were in union with their God. Something that the seed of Cain could not have. You and I, we may not be as prosperous as the people in the world. Maybe we will not have the best jobs, have our names written in history books. We will not come out as great inventors or artists or musicians. Maybe even aspects of common grace we won't get to experience. But we have a unique relationship with God. We know Him as our God and we dwell under the shadow of His wings. Moses, he pleaded with God to not send him with the people of God to the promised land unless His presence would be with them. He understood that it was the presence of God that mattered. Not richness, not wealth, not a whole lot of land that flowed with milk and honey. What really mattered was the presence of God with them. And we are much happier Christians if we also understand this. If we understand that it is the Lord that is our portion in our inheritance. See, for example, Enoch, the son of Cain, the first Enoch. He had a city named after him. One could say maybe that he inherited an earthly city. The first city ever built was named after Enoch. However, there was a second Enoch from the family of Seth, from the godly family. And this second Enoch, he didn't have a city name, named after him. He didn't have his dad building him a city and, and giving it to him. But by faith, he walked with God and he was taken up to God before experiencing death. So while Enoch, the son of Cain, he inherited an earthly city, Enoch, the son of Seth, inherited the heavenly Jerusalem, the city of God. He had perfect and eternal communion with God. His Lord. He had something much greater than a, an earthly city. He had the heavenly Jerusalem. And for us to have the Lord is much better than having your mortgage sorted. To have the Lord is much better than having a, a proper job or the job of your dreams. To have the Lord it is much better than having perfect physical health. It is much better than marriage. To have the Lord is much better than having children. Because the Lord is our great inheritance. 
having the Lord is, is much better than anything we can imagine, anything we can have in this world. What really matters is to have the Lord as our God, to call him by his name and to belong to him. And while the family of Cain produced poems like Lamech did, while they boasted about their wickedness, we see what the people of God had. Have a look at chapter 5, verse 29. What the people of God receive. They receive a Noah. They receive someone that brings rest to the earth. They receive from God someone who was to get rid of all the Lamechts of this world. We may not be health, uh, healthy, we may not be powerful, we may not be rich, but we have this promise from God, the promise of true rest. We have received from God a greater Noah who was to bring spiritual rest to us. We received from God a greater Noah who would deliver us from sin, from the world, from the devil, from death. We received from God the one who would get rid of a thousand Lamechs who boast about their weaknesses, of wickedness. We as the seed of Seth, we as those who belong to Christ, we received from God his own begotten son. The glory of Cain the prosperity of his family, his boasts, his arrogance, it all would pass away. It would all go. But the prosperity of the people of God, your prosperity, would last forever. Cain received children, he received wife, he received a family. Yet he died in his sins, in his iniquity. But you and I, we have the Lord. We have forgiveness of sins. We inherit all the promises from the Bible. We inherit the heavenly Jerusalem. We inherit his blessing and his presence that is much greater than a family, that is much greater than a city, that is much greater than success in this world. We inherit the Lord. The Lord, dear brothers and sisters, he is faithful to his people. He cares for you. He loves you. You belong to him. Let him and him only be your joy. Let him and him only be the reason of your boasting. So in response to that, we should stand and sing our final hymn and praise God for his faithfulness towards us. Because great is his faithfulness. There is no shadow of turning in him. He changes not. His compassions, they fail not. All that he, that he has been, he forever will be. Let us stand and sing.
Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Amen.